Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to Episode 7 of Let's Talk ETC. I'm your host, Carlo V, along with my co-host, Dr. Christian Severino. I want to thank the ETC devs, investors, miners, users, and other community members for an incredible 2016. Uh, it's been pretty crazy to see how much the ETC community has progressed in such a short amount of time. So uh, just big shout out to everybody that has made you know where we're at today possible. Also, uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, the ETC newsletter will be in the description below. Uh, the last newsletter that was pushed out, which was pushed out like right before the end of the year, was packed. So I suggest you guys check that out. Uh, it featured info on the Die Hard Protocol upgrade, which is coming in a couple of weeks at, at block 3 million. Um, also, thank you to everyone who contributed on that. Uh, nothing would be possible without all the hard work the ETC devs put in. Um, the protocol upgrade includes uh, the difficulty bomb delay, which was something that was being discussed, you know, here in Europe or in Asia, pretty much everywhere. So it's really, really great. We finally have that on the board. Uh, there's an EXP reprice and replay protection, which is pretty awesome. Uh, also featured in there are stories, uh, you know, ETC is on the lookout for Rust and JF devs, JS devs, so that's cool. ETC exchange launches. Um, so it's a story about ETC win. So there's more info on that in there. Um, Ethereum Classic is now available at Exchange de Montreal. So another exchange on the board, which is awesome. Uh, also, you can use ETC to buy any open bazaar item using the Shift integration. Um, also in there, there's two recent IOHK publications, BTC Mining Pool. Uh, thank you from the ETC win meeting. Uh, there's also a couple of celebration picks in there. Uh, also, the instructional video series released by ePool. He's been pushing out a few more videos with that, so it's pretty informative. If you're interested in mining, check that out. And uh, Christian, Dr. Severino's last article, which was about zero-knowledge proofs. The ETC monetary policy is still in there, and also the call to action for help with the Wikipedia page. Uh, another couple of quick reminders. There's a winter school in Shanghai where IOHK's very own Agalos Kiasis is presenting. Info on that will be posted in the description on YouTube. It wasn't in the last newsletter, but it'll be in the newsletter that's featured uh, tomorrow, uh, January 4th, for anybody listening right now. We have another great guest with us this week. Um, he's part of the ETC development community, and I'm psyched to have him on. He's a constant contributor on Slack, GitHub, and a ton of other channel channels. Special guest, Prophet Daniel. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Yes, hello. It is my pleasure to be here today. Hello. From Chris. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I, I know uh, where, by the way, where, where are you from, Daniel? I am from Brazil, actually. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, that's awesome. I've already lived in the United States and also Italy. Okay, so, so you're I, definitely I, more I cultured than me. Yeah, Daniel, um, my father is from Brazil, and I know Portuguese, but uh, we probably better not talk Portuguese, uh, otherwise we'll uh, exclude I actually didn't else. know that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's awesome, Sabrina. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, Como vai? Um, <laughs> oh, how you guys are starting right. Oh, so, um, so I went to, so was, again, thanks, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so something we do frequently on the show for everyone their first time on since the community is interested in kind of knowing what's going on with the devs and what their background is and just a little bit about who's behind the, the ETC community and stuff. So just a little bit about your background and general stuff like that. Okay, so I am a, an electronics engineer and uh, I also graduated from a master's in the advanced controls with artificial intelligence techniques and I've been working in a multinational company that builds appliances and I've working with technologies to make sure that it's going to to be the best uh, appliances worldwide so uh, we apply a lot of different technologies there and uh, with the blockchain with Bitcoin actually in the past 
So this is something, uh, it, it is like a hobby to me because I see there's a lot of merit and the future is going to be associated with the blockchain in, in a very deep ways, yeah. in my understanding. Yep, agreed. So that's uh, that's a heck of a background. So that's that's pretty awesome. And so, you know, everybody has their own rabbit hole story, the way they kind of fell into blockchain technology and stuff. So you you had the electrical, I'm sorry, what was it, electrical engineering? Electrical engineering. Yeah, yeah so you had the electrical engineering background. What was your first uh, trip into the blockchain world? How did you get into blockchain? When did you first hear about it, stuff like that? Back in 2012, uh, I was assembling a computer, a uh, great computer, and uh, it was uh, cooled with water. It was a, a very good computer, and uh, I, I utilized a big radiator above it, so it was b very powerful. And the, the winter was approaching, so I decided to make something with that computer to hit the room. And yeah. I wanted to, to push uh, to the limit the processing capability of the machine. And I was able to do that. But the problem was I was spending a lot of uh, energy from that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I was looking for a way to sell the processing power. And what I uh, found was Bitcoin. There was a possibility yeah. to, to mine and sell. I started mining. It was... Uh, only the, the in the winter nights, I was able to to collect twenty five bitcoins. Oh, at man. that winter, holy yeah! So it was very very fun. I was with a limited budget at the time, and the good thing was, I didn't spend all the bitcoins. Uh, I had like them. <laughs> yeah. So at the time I was also studying cryptography in the masters. I had a very good uh, professor there. And uh, he asked people to make a presentation about something related to the subject. And my presentation was about Bitcoin. So nobody there was, uh, was already knowing what Bitcoin was. So it was a great presentation, everybody was very eager to to and after that i decided to invest all the stocks i had in the market into bitcoin <laughs> at the time i had yeah i had like forty thousand us dollars in the stocks i decided to buy everything are you kidding me oh my is this like like midas touch here <laughs> and uh at the time, a uh, Bitcoin was worth four and a half dollars. Okay, yes. so yep. I decided this is the future. This is something that's going to happen, and it's going to be very bright. I, yeah. I was arri yeah. arrived home, but I I needed my wife uh, approval of that. The problem was she vetted. She didn't want that to happen. She said I was crazy. Come on, you're crazy. That's for buying a house for us. So, no. yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I am uh, brainwashed or something, and I didn't invest a penny at the time. Uh, but no. I was, I was still with my 20, 25 bitcoins in my wallet. Okay, the, I'm sorry. This isn't my normal follow-up question, but I have to ask: Are you divorced now? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, but <laughs> that wasn't the case. <laughs> okay. Right. It actually has nothing to do with that. Oh, geez. Well, that would have been my number one reason. <laughs> so um, we had a, we, uh, one question. I had a, I, uh, an investor, uh, Daniel, and, uh, uh, you know, when, when this comes up, you know, how much risk. And so he suggested one idea was to just put a little bit of money that you can afford to lose. So... Uh, it's too bad you couldn't compromise and maybe instead of putting 100%, put, you know, 10% in Bitcoin. Maybe that could have made everybody happy. Yeah, so it is because in my relationships, I usually, uh, I am very open and I respect the other uh, opinion about that. And we, when we are talking about investments, mm -hmm. we, we were with the intention to buy a house 
So this is something we thought about and even though uh, we didn't accept that way, uh, in my opinion, it would be 100% invested, okay? Mm -hmm. We instead kept investing in the stocks, in the stock market, and it, there was, uh, we had a portfolio of 10 stocks, and it increased a lot, like 200%. So it, it was very good for me anyway, but it wasn't in a virtual currency that was uh, frightening my wife. Mm, I see. Yeah, right. Now, I, I, I understand her point of view, honestly. It's not, it's not like a lot of people understood it, um, you know, back then. And still a lot of people don't even understand it now. So yeah. it's definitely understandable. But uh, Daniel, so, you, actually, I have to, you gave me another idea. You said that you wanted to heat your house. And so I wonder if um, that's a way to justify the cost of mining for if somebody lives in a cold climate, instead of turning on the heater, get a bunch of computers, right? I wonder how that, if how much more cost effective it would be, or if that would be lucrative to do it mining that way. In a cold yeah. Climate. In my opinion, indeed it is, because uh, if you have a hardware, you can put that hardware under your uh, bed. So <laughs> the heat is going towards uh, the body. So yeah. this is something very interesting because people are trying to get uh, get rid of the heat, mm -hmm. but in this case, as it is very cold, the heat is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the more you the more you have, the better. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to have uh, more more miners as well. Um, not for heating though, but <laughs> <laughs> so um, so that's that's the story of the first um, you know first way you got into to blockchain or into Bitcoin. So what kind of segued you into ETC? Um, I guess I'm not sure if you were interested in Ethereum before the fork or you were interested in ETC after the fork. So what's the story? How did you shift from Bitcoin and blockchain and what, what interested you in ETC specifically? Since there's so many different chains now, you know, there's thousands and thousands of chain. What interests you in ETC initially, and what interests you in ETC now? Uh, yeah, so, so what captured my attention was Bitcoin, okay? After that, right. uh, another important thing which happened was Ethereum. Ethereum, in the beginning, I didn't understand how it worked because I didn't have uh, enough touch with the development side of Ethereum, with the news, but, uh, as time went by, to better understand how it worked, this huge computer, which has all the nodes connected and uh, uh, processing the smart contracts. And again, I, I was uh, very impressed with it, as I was with Bitcoin. So I, I tried to give value to my sixth sense and say, come on, this is another Bitcoin. This is another uh, disruptive technology. So I want to be together with this. I want to be part of the ecosystem. But it was too late because Ethereum was already uh, evolved. Right. And I saw there were a lot of problems there. A lot of, uh, you know, it was done in a very centralized way. That was hurting me because I always thought this centralization is uh, the key. That's why Bitcoin was very successful and they were doing it in another way. So first level is decentralization inside the technology, which is great, and Bitcoin uh, brought that to us. And the second level is decentralization of the organization, and the first Ethereum had the concepts of that to happen, how it would happen. And now there was Ethereum Classic, because the, there was the DAO hack, which happened and it was a very bad thing. They took the wrong decision to uh, fork, trying to retrieve the funds. They tried to solve a problem, which right. which was in the, uh, the DAO actually, but they tried to solve in the wrong layer. They tried to solve inside the Tivon platform, which was an, a mistake in my opinion. So at that time I started uh, working with Ethereum Classic we were only four, four people in the beginning. 
but right. we needed a philosophical alignment. We needed to make sure there would be a community entering uh, in a happy way, contributing, receiving their rewards, receiving uh, experience, and being attached, feeling uh, emotionally attached to this huge project we have today. Thanks. Uh, uh, you got in very early then. You were. Uh, yeah, I, I believe he was part of the uh, original four. Okay, wow. So, what um, did you. What things are you working on specifically? What components interest you? So, I, I always tried to be uh, giving the community a philosophical alignment. Uh huh. Okay. But I, as I am a developer, I also uh, was watching the development side, the way it was evolving. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw there was a problem with the Mist Wallet. We didn't have for months a Mist Wallet. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to intervene and make uh, the, the first build. So uh, yes, I passed that to, to other developers and uh, I am glad that he is working now. We have a, a version of MIS which is working. We need to improve it, mm -hmm. and uh, That's I, awesome. I am able to. I, I am able to work with that together with other developers, uh, and it is important to have a good communication because there are some components which interact among them. For example, there's GET, and uh, the MIST is going to interact with the latest version we have. Mm -hmm. So this is something, it is a, a, a team development we have. Mm -hmm. So how does that work out for you? Um, the, the communication, um, what's, how, is that effective? Is there any issues or pretty much the tools work? It is effective. There are issues, we try to solve the issues. Issues, uh, most of them it is because uh, I, this is not my full-time job. This is something that I do in the, when I have spare time to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever we need to, to communicate, it, it needs to be very effective. We need to uh, make sure we are delivering the message we want to be delivered and the problem is going to fix it, to be fixed on time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, so, yeah, go ahead. Definitely. No, I'm curious, do you guys ever, so uh, email and Slack are, are convenient because you don't have to wait for the other person to be live at the same time that right but i'm curious do you ever have any issues where you guys say you know what it, well, let's just let's just all get on a on a you know google hangouts uh skype call or something and then hash it out there all in person does that ever happen yes it happened it happened uh, a few times but not with all the developers it happened yeah. with a few people which were uh, working with the project, which were directly involved with it. Okay, not uh, it, it was not a big uh, meeting with everybody involved because we have different, uh, you know, timings. Time zones. Because yeah. people, yes, people are spread all over the globe. It is hard to have everybody in the same uh, space. But yeah. anyway, uh, we do as much as we can. And another thing that I worked on and I, I am still working with, it is uh, updating the website. As the first website was uh, generated by, by Bit Novosti, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a, a very raw version. So we wanted to increase it. At the time, uh, I was working with the Declaration of Independence together with other guys. Mm -hmm. And, and that yeah, was very interesting because at the same time there was the site development and we were able to deliver a good website which now has the blog space which now has also the place to put the, the press releases. And lately I've been uh, updating the press uh, which are positive for the Ethereum Classic community. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thanks for all you do. That's great. So the website work and the mist work and the other things. So, right. Yeah. I re I remember that when the website was getting redone and the declaration was going on, it was like, uh, you know, the, the everything was crazy in Slack. You know, like a hundred <laughs> messages a second. I remember we would go through the ten thousand message limit in like two days at the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. That, that so, uh, interesting thing was that uh, all started in uh, GitHub when we started an issue there. We were saying we are uh, in the first moment on time where we have the opportunity to build this great community. So people got uh, a lot involved emotionally with that. And they started working with the declaration as the first deliverable. And there were others. So things got structured in a very good way. And now we have this great community. Yeah, absolutely. Do, um, you, do you use uh, Reddit a lot or at all? No, uh, I don't use it a lot. I, I use it just to, to take a look to the news just to uh, contact with other people there, but not uh, very frequently. Yeah, yeah, I think he's a, he's a lurker, not a, not a contributor on there. Yeah, I, well, the reason I brought that up was, um, what would we have done if there wasn't Reddit? Um, you couldn't do, you couldn't bring the, make a new community on Facebook unless you, well, I guess everybody does have Facebook. Oh, I think, I, what would you I, think do? I can answer that. I think the forum, the ETC forum would be a lot more popular if we didn't have Reddit, actually. Okay. Okay. Like on 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 Bitcoin Talk. Uh huh. Um. Or or we would have our own dedicated forum, I think. But yeah, I, I think Reddit is um pretty pretty good for the community. I agree. What do What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I think it is uh, the place where you can get the news in a very uh, fast way. So whenever you have something related to the Ethereum Classic, the faster way to receive news, it is, in my opinion, with Reddit. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, just especially, based on especially since it's just so easy for the entire community to make contributions about what's going on. Um, it's not just a few different people and it's not, um, you know, just chat stuff inside Slack. It's actual, you know, headline posts and, you know, important stuff that, is, is posted there constantly so yeah no but you mentioned a bitcoin talk the etc forum my only concern there would be let's say there was a new person out there stumbling into this technology um it might take them a while before they stumble upon bitcoin talk whereas everybody or more people know about reddit so it's i would i could i could imagine new people stumbling into etc via reddit faster than the the agree 100 percent yeah so uh one of the interesting things uh that i believe it is we need to be where people are okay so if, if there are a lot of people there utilizing reddit people who don't use slack we need to be there also we need to be we need to make sure that we are going to engage more people we will have more contribution contributors are going to have their rewards and we are going to grow organically in a decentralized way so the, the reason why I think it is important to be anonymous it is to avoid to avoid some problems of non-anonymous uh, identities okay one of them it is uh, I am involved with other projects so I, I want to meet, to make sure that Ethereum Classic community has its own share and I'm not going to be uh, confused with somebody else that has nothing to do with Ethereum Classic. In in that regard, I think the 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 way it is structured, it's going to be built in a more robust way, mm -hmm. without unnecessary problems in the future. Mm -hmm. What do you think about? Uh, just as a different topic, but uh, I'm I was kind of impressed that the Parity client uses Rust. Are you? Have you looked into Rust at all? And that seems like an interesting language to me. Yes, uh, uh, this is not something in my background. I don't know much. I don't know a lot about Rust, but uh, Parity it is a very famous client. So uh, we are looking for Rust developers. We are looking for uh, full-time Rust developers and JavaScript developers. And the reason is there is Parity. Yes. Uh, which utilizes a lot of Rust. But there are a lot of different technologies, different languages, which would be even more efficient to use, faster to, to, to mine, faster to interact with the blockchain and so on. So uh, in my understanding, we need to always keep watching the, the available languages we have 
and the benefits they can bring to, to the community. So I'm curious, what do you think would be a faster language for uh, a, uh, an Ethereum classic node than Rust? Okay, so if you take a look to the benchmark, C++ is one of the fastest languages there are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is also C Sharp, there are all the other languages which are uh, object oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it would be worth, we already have the ETH client, so it is written in C++ language, but not all the functionalities are there yet. Mm -hmm. This is something which needs to be improved. We need to put the, the other functionalities there. I see. Which, which we already have in the get client. Yes. Now, um, uh, just in defense of Rust, um, the, my guess is that the reason, it's not because C++ is inherently a superior language. I think the compilers are more mature. So I would, uh, I would guess that in time, the Rust compilers will evolve to be much faster and maybe competitive with C++. Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that because uh, you can create a lot of different languages, created different languages which were interacting with UML diagrams and they generated uh, the text you want. It was, it was able to generate, for example, C language, C++ language, mm -hmm. Java language, whatever you want, no problem. But the thing is, each language has its own architecture. For, for example, Java needs to have a virtual machine they're running. There's a overhead for doing so, but there are other benefits. And uh, actually what needs to happen it is the current technology we already have. We don't have the future Rust compiler yet. What we have it is today, we have the, the actual Rust compiler which gives this result. Mm -hmm. So if we try other paths, we can compare the, the performance and see what uh, is delivering the most for the community. Okay, okay. So um, you, I, it, interesting about emitting different languages. Um, I wonder if you could make a C client, how fast that would be, or maybe even convert Rust to C or uh, I'm just thinking out loud some other ideas. Um, yeah, the problem of C, it is it doesn't have it is not it is not object oriented. Yeah, that's. But true. indeed, if if you were able to put everything in C statements, for sure it would be faster than the C plus plus or even the Go client because it would be hard coded there. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, some good things there are with. with uh, higher level languages like uh, exception, mm -hmm. uh, handling, and so on, you wouldn't have there in a native form. You would have to build in, in your own way. So yes. this is something, it's always a balance. You lose something, you gain something. Yes. And we need to, to have the pros and cons of, of each solution we have there. What are your, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the Scala client? Um, that the Groton Deke team is, is working on. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Scala. Is it Scala yes, or Scala, Scala, by the way? Uh, I think it's well, Scala. it depends. <laughs> For example, here in Brazil, it would be Scala. <laughs> if you say okay, perfect. somewhere else, it would be Scala. Whoever, whoever says I'm not pronouncing it wrong, I'll agree with them. So Scala, good. <laughs> so uh, Scala is based in Java. Okay, so it is like a evolved Java, and it has a lot of merits for doing so. For example, exception handling is very good in Scala, and it also has a, a mathematical design which is very good for solving math problems. And cryptography, it, is, it has a lot of math to be solved. So it, it makes a lot of sense, okay? Excellent. And uh, the, there's also a big, a big development community around Java, as it is very close to Java, Scala. Uh, we have this greater community. It's going to be easier to find developers for this language. Yeah. Um, do you know anything about Haskell by any chance, Daniel? Haskell? I'm not very familiar with that, but I've heard. Because I've I heard know... Some people. 
Yeah, I know that there's, like you said, there's more uh, Scala developers, Scala, and um, but I know a lot of people say good things about Haskell. So I just wondered how you thought they compared for making secure smart contracts. Okay, so, yeah, I, I think some sometimes we need to uh, sometimes we need to make sure we don't. We are not increasing complexity because software it is managing complexity in a good way. Mm -hmm. If we find, if you say Haskell is a great language, maybe it is better than Scala, which we already have and we are used to that. So we need people, we need developers to show, to show a test case and see, uh, for example, pros and cons of this different problems when we try to solve this is the conclusion we have mm -hmm. so it would be faster to develop but maybe not that faster to to run mm -hmm. or right. the other way around i see i see what you're saying so uh, until there's a lot of different cases and people working on different things in different languages it's you know that's the best way to determine what the pros and cons are of each Yes, uh, I, I think right now we have people uh, who are uh, full stack developers, but the thing is the technologies are advancing at so fast pace that we are creating hundreds of languages. Mm -hmm. So for, all, for only one person to be, uh, you know, fluent on all those 100 languages. Yeah, so that's another concern is then you have to, people, the developers have to then learn the new language that people say is better. And is that worth the, right, the cost to do that? Yeah, right. Yeah. So as a community, we need to orient people, the development community, to, to a place where we are going to be successful in the future. If we point to another language which is going to be discontinued in the future, we are doing the wrong in the wrong way. So uh, we need to be aware of all the languages which are developing, which have a lot of uh, contributors, developers, and make sure that our choices are the right ones for the community. Yes. Agreed. So, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. sorry to derail the conversation a little bit, but this is something kind of uh, a lot of our viewers or listeners ask, and they want to, they want to know where some of our devs or some of our community members, where do they see blockchain, you know, in the near future or in the distant future? Where do they see ETC, you know, in the near future and in the distant future? So maybe like a near term, interesting use case that's not around yet. And then maybe uh, a kind of a crazy use case that's 20 years down the road for blockchain, if you have any. Okay. So the thing that I like, that I think it is very strong inside uh, Ethereum Classic, it is the compromise with values. Okay, we values are very important for every single company we have. And uh, when we have an image of a brand, we attach that image to the value that the company has, because there is a community around that image. There's a community around. Uh, those specific values which are so important. So this compromise, it is, in my opinion, the gold we have and we need to take care of it. So uh, once blockchain started, the disruption was being able to transact value in a digital way. You don't have to take gold and uh, weight gold and make sure it is pure to send to somebody else. That is a very uh, bad way to do it because it's not that fast. All right, it is safe. It is uh, the way people are used to do for thousands of years. But now we have a better choice, a better opportunity. And there's also the smart contract uh, way of doing things. Mm -hmm. in, in, in my opinion, in the near term, for example, there are a lot of uh, applications to do. For example, one of the applications it is, I was talking about the iLux project. iLux it is, uh, it is a software that manages people identity, visual identity. 
it is able to schedule for the whole week the, the codes, the garments people are going to use, and also uh, being aware of the, the weather forecast. For example, it's going to rain that day, so the, the look scheduled for tomorrow, it's not the best one, okay? okay? So this is something very interesting because the software would be able, for example, to publish the information of the utilized look that day to the blockchain. Whenever there is a picture posted to a social network, that picture would be tied to the information of the look people are utilizing. And uh, when celebrities start utilizing that software, there would be also uh, th there would be also everything published there. People could buy that exactly same look, just okay. taking a look to the picture which was already there published. So it's like a so a fashion application. That would be a right. Yeah, actually, it is. Uh, I'm sorry, it, Daniel. Daniel actually posted. Um, Kind of a little bit of a breakdown on this on Slack way back. This is the this is the one you sent to me and a few others, like a few months ago, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, th this so, that was cool. That was really cool. But why does that benefit from the blockchain as compared to uh, a web application? The benefit it is you were able to publish the look information to the blockchain to that specific person, okay? And uh, each person has a different biometric uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. Those parameters would be already there in the application, in the software. So whenever you, uh, whenever you download a new look, it's going to be fully adapted to your biometric parameters. Okay. And your biometric parameters can be uh, tracked uh, in different times. For example, I started making gym uh -huh. in November, so my biometric parameters starting started to change. You could also uh, understand if that person is uh, gaining uh, weight or losing weight. The doctor could take a look to that information and check. Mm -hmm. So this is something very good because people would be able to change their uh, habits as it is positive or not. They started eating something that's good, they yeah. started making gym, they started having more friends and so on, practicing oh. sports. Oh, okay. So, so you wouldn't want to maybe, one argument for not having a web server is you wouldn't want to trust that, that personal informa health information to the website, you would, it would be better to have it on the blockchain where it was uh, sensor proof, also available to lots of different applications. And right. Yeah, okay, now I understand why the blockchain would be a good idea. So the blockchain, it needs to be in the blockchain because people would uh, need to provide authorization for others to browse that info. Yeah. Right. Okay, you don't want, you, you don't want to somebody else uh, trying to access your information because uh, they they wouldn't hire you if you get the info. Yeah, and also if let's say I so there was a startup that was trying to do this, and the people might be, might not want to put too much effort to share their information because if the company goes bankrupt, right, they did all that work for nothing. But on the blockchain, right, that's it's always going to be there. You're not worried that the, the startup company behind the website is going to go bankrupt or disappear. Yes. And uh, the, the reason I started this project was because I was uh, taking a look to the community. There, there were a few women there. And um, I said, come on, we need to have a more balanced community. And uh, we need to be, as I said, where people are. People uh, want to have... Uh, <laughs> a very a very interesting application they, they want to have fun with this technology and most technology people are uh, geeks they don't understand very well how uh, real life works but yeah I was gonna say, uh, I was gonna say when I was at uh, I went to to coin agenda 
uh, what was that like the the end of October, and uh, you know it was it, it was all of us and you know it was ninety percent guys, so I, I forget who said it. Someone was like, "We got to do something about this, guys," because it was like you know, it was like ten guys to every one girl. It just looked ridiculous <laughs> um, compared to any other conference. But I spoke with um, I spoke with someone who was older that you know spoke about some of the conferences you know for you know internet you know 19, 19 early 1990s and they said it was kind of the same way and now if you go to a conference like uh uh you know an apple conference or google um it, it you know it's you know people ton of people everywhere from all walks of life so as long as we keep working growing the community i think uh more you know i guess girls or people in general will be interested but uh, I, I agree with you about, you know, fun applications are, are definitely important. Yes. So what I think it is important for us right now, for the application side, it is to make sure that technology is not, is not uh, changing the way the business should be. Okay? When we want to sell, what we need to have it is a great business, not great technology, great businesses. Mm -hmm. To have great businesses, we can help with the technology behind in the backstage. So when we sell, sometimes we, we don't need even to say it has the blockchain behind. What it does it is uh, a look scheduler. So <laughs> it for general people, it has nothing to do with the blockchain. But if you are a geek, if you want to understand how does that magical app works, right? So yeah. you, you can dig into that and see the, the magical happening behind. Yeah, I'm right. guessing yeah. that you would probably, I'm guessing you would probably want a cell phone application so the users would, would think that, that your, this, this, this software is just a, a cell phone application, but really it's in the blockchain, but they don't need to care about that. Yeah, th that's the interesting part. Because if you take a look today, which application it is successful in the blockchain, it is hard to find, isn't it? Maybe because people are not uh, are forgetting about the business mm -hmm. and are uh, focusing too much in the technology. So I think it has to be the other way around. I, I know what you mean. I think um, also, you know, just like where we're at today with such. Um, friendly user experiences and, and user-friendly applications. Everyone, you know, you, you even see kids interacting with their iPads. They're three years old. You know, they don't need to understand the binary, what's going on in the background. They just use it. So um, with what you're talking about or with what blockchain might develop into in the future or will develop into in the future, it'll get more user-friendly to the point that people don't even know what they're using is blockchain. They just know it and love it because it's so convenient and they just accept it for what it is. Exactly. So right. this first project, the uh, iLux Club project, it is something closer to the reality people already are used to. So it, it's going to be deployed to the Ethereum Classic blockchain in the end. And uh, we had a research grant. So we are trying to understand if this is going to happen because there was the Brexit and the institution which would be the vehicle for the funds to to be uh, oh no oh wow okay. the institution it is in UK and the university is actually in uh, Europe so we are trying to understand if uh, we we start a different company a different institution in the Europe in Europe it would uh, work or not okay but Regardless of that, it is a great idea, and I think this one can uh, help Ethereum Classic community because it once deployed, if it's going to grow a lot, it could pull everything behind it. Mm -hmm. And for the future, what I see, there are different projects. This one is, is closer to reality today, but mm -hmm. for the future, we have different things. For example, the United Nations uh, target they have for 2030. This is something way broader than just a fashion application because what they want to do it is to have uh, zero poverty in 2030 and it's very close to that. 
And I think, yes, it is possible to achieve. They want to reduce uh, the inequality we have. They want to improve the quality of life, the access to uh, health care, and so on. They want to actually make people more happy because we have some people today which are happy, but most of people, they are not happy. They don't live in a, in a very good way. And I think the blockchain it is a technology that can uh, bring those marginalized people uh, to the game. Yes, and I, help. Think, I, I think you're right. I think, yeah, the like, Agreed. for example, the poor, you have very poor people now can almost afford a smartphone, right? And then, so once you have a smartphone, you have the internet. And once, once you have a cell phone app, you have the blockchain. So you have immense, um, you know, possible wealth creation there uh, just from that simple tool. So I could see the blockchain being a big part of that wealth creation and helping the world's poor. I, I think, uh, I think it would be awesome to see um, places in, in Africa or, you know, underdeveloped countries and any underdeveloped country go through kind of like a internet blockchain, um, you know, kind of like there was the industrial revolution in a lot of these other countries, but the industrial revolution kind of didn't happen in a lot of these underdeveloped countries. So if they had an internet blockchain boom that made everything a lot more efficient and got a lot more work done so that we could pull them out of, you know, very, very um, extreme poverty, I think that would be awesome. Sure. Now, I had another question for you, Daniel. We were discussing how the tools get better in time and eventually everything gets, um, or typically if there's enough interest, things get easier. But you you were not afraid to start at the beginning of ETC with, right, when everything wasn't so perfect and, and finished. So you're, I assume you're one of those people that kind of likes that. You're not afraid of, of uh, primitive or new technology? Yes, uh, it's interesting question. <laughs> yes, it is. Because, you know, when you are compromised with the values, when you see the big picture years ahead, when you want to reduce inequality, when you want to, to make sure you have a community that is fair, that has merit, that's the motivation where you can take a lot of fuel from that. And I saw, I saw it was very different from the Tiburon Foundation and so on. Because people were more compromised with the values mm -hmm. rather than the money itself. Yeah. But then right now we have some problems with the money uh, management. That's normal. We, we will always have problems and solutions with that. Mm -hmm. But uh if you uh don't respect the values then you do have a great problem that's why th their mistake was uh taken yeah so i think i think what you're trying to say is that the passion for a project can can overcome a lot of initial problems that you might have is that right yeah Yes. Uh, why do you do that? What's your motivation to do that? To yeah. boost, to work several times a week in a project that you don't know if it's going to succeed. No, it's not the the success of the project actually the targets. The target it is uh, you want to do every day the right thing, mm -hmm. the things you believe, the things you you think it's going uh, to contribute the most to society. Yes. Very good. right. Grow, growing, growing the pie, <laughs> so, so to speak. Well, that was all oh. I had. Carla, did you have uh, anything else? Yeah. So that was, uh, and he actually filled me in on that project a few months ago. It was really cool. Um, I'll, I'll speak to him after the show and try to get some info. Um, maybe some of the stuff he posted before, and we could link it in the description uh, uh, for YouTube. But so that was a. Uh, immediate kind of current-ish project. What do you see on the horizon for blockchain, say 20 years in the future, 30 years in the future, kind of like a, a, a crazy scenario that, of things blockchain could do? I brought this up to one of our last guests, um, Mackerel, and I was talking about 
you know, drones dropping stuff off, which drove him crazy since that was his wheelhouse, as he said it. But uh, yeah, so what, what do you see for blockchain, you know, uh, the year, you know, 20XX, 20, 2035 or something? Okay, so one of the things that I see it is uh, we, couldn't, we, we couldn't have a false uh, democracy where they say, come on, let's give freedom to people everybody should have access to information being able to publish their thoughts but what happens is uh, actually the media has a lot of power and the, the guys behind the media are the richest guys so they have voice the poor ones they don't have much voice the internet improved that uh, scenario a lot and now we have the blockchain the blockchain is going to improve that even further so uh, I think what it's going to be the greatest disruption is the way the governance works because uh, if you take a look to the way the companies are inside they are the same way they were a hundred years ago opinion that's not right okay why why are cars built in a uh, so efficient way why are cars built in with uh, high technology because those people they have a lot of conscience about what they are doing if you use a full democracy if you want to other people to build a car with the for example the baker would have the same voting power as the engineer we would have not a good car in the end mm -hmm. so yeah. this, this is something which needs to improve Full democracy was very good in the past when everybody were uh, was ignorant. So everybody didn't know much about technology. They could have the same voting power. But as things have evolved a lot, we need to change that landscape. For example, if we are going to decide how we are going to allocate the resources, because we, we can allocate in several different ways resources we have a lot of ideas we want them to be funded and uh, productive mm -hmm. to collect the results in the end but resources are limited that's why we need a strategy uh, to select the best ideas to fund mm -hmm. and for sure it's not going to be a single person which is going to decide uh, which way to go it's going to be the community deciding mm -hmm. And if there are people who are not very aware of that technology, their voting power would be less. So this is something, uh, in my opinion, we need to develop to make sure companies are going to behave in a different way, in a more productive way, where people are happier than uh, they are today. Yes. Yeah, so because okay. companies are very uh, authorit uh, they, they have a lot of uh, hierarchy inside. Yeah the way they behave make people uh, less happy so uh, I think that's the path for the future trying to increase happiness with technology if we come up with a system where uh, people are rewarded to do things even though they, they don't know what they are doing because they are ignorant on that subject but somehow they are rewarded to do the right thing Mm -hmm. And the right. other people, which are very conscious, which have a lot of conscience about the subject, they are trying to set the strategies to reward people, the way the system works, the dynamics, to make right. sure in the end we are going to have a great society to everyone. Yeah. Right. So I think so, I think if I understood you, one of the points that you you said that or well, that you made was that you you we don't want to have. Um, uh, centralization decentralization is a good thing but we don't want to go to the extreme where anybody votes for everything everybody votes for everything we want to have more we want to have a balance right we want to have decentralization but more effective democracy more effective voting so the best of both worlds so something something I had spoke about with uh, uh, Daniel you know, a, a few months ago, or there was a lot of chatter about it when we were talking about different governance models and stuff like that, was um, the, the benefits that blockchain provides to take advantage of, you know, the wisdom of crowds that weren't necessarily possible before. Mm, sure. So there are, um, say you have like a, you know, $100 billion company that 
does issue shares to their employees in certain ways, if you had a $100 billion company operating where people worked and they were issued shares, these shares could then potentially be utilized to take advantage of the wisdom of crowds and certain things could then be decided upon by entire communities to make the best decision possible, potentially. I see. So voting is a big uh, potential uh, source of innovation. I'm, I'm also for, uh, I, I don't know about Daniel, but I'm for, you know, weighted voting because I, I think. I think that's um, what Daniel was, that's yeah, another think, way of saying. What right, I think, because I think shares in a company, in order to take advantage of the wisdom of crowds, you can't have, um, you know, the intern who just joined and been there for a week and has one share have his knowledge and what he knows about the company count as one vote and someone that is, you know, a, a, a core, you know, or lead developer that's been there for 10 years and is in charge of 10 different projects. And if it's something specific about the community, then he gets one vote. I think you lose the wisdom of crowds in a situation like that. So there has to be some way to weight the, the different Yeah, I think wait, I think waiting is important. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I'm not, uh, this isn't my wheelhouse, so to speak, but. Yeah, interesting question. Yes. It is hard to think about the future because we are tied to the current reality where we are at right now. Right. So uh, the, the first move it is uh, to make sure the concepts are not uh, holding you from uh, building the future. Mm -hmm. So th right. this is going to be a, a, a very new way to uh, run society. And uh, one of the one of the projects I was working on was also the uh, decentralized collective judgments issue. Okay. And uh, this is something that I started a blockchain library. I, I'm working on different projects there. And uh, the reason is I'm trying to make small moves, building this, the bridge to make sure we are going to reach the, the final goal in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about that we have a problem in the current judgment system where you have the judge, which is known by the defendant, and the defendant, and, and the judge also knows who is the defendant. Mm -hmm. So it is a single point of failure which we have there. Bri bribery could happen. Mm -hmm. Right. It could be done in a very different way where the judge uh, shouldn't be known by the defendant and vice versa. So uh, in my opinion, there should be a, a set of judges and they would judge the case regardless of who is the defendant because they don't know who he is. They know uh, the attitude which was, you know, uh, steal a car. That were the conditions of the car. And after the, sense, the sentence is made, uh, I think that way marginalization wouldn't happen that often mm -hmm. as the way it is today. So I that's see. a small case which applies uh, the future technology already today. Okay. Now, I don't, I uh, I don't, uh, I don't want to belabor this too much. I just, the, the idea that popped in my head is that during the court case, the information that's going to be shared, the judge could go and do a internet search and probably, right, probably find the the name of the anonymous defendant, right? If he has some quotes from the defendant. Yes, that, there's a friend of mine. Yes, I don't want to screw his life. <laughs> what if? Well, I mean, maybe this is a hundred years in the future. What if, if you hadn't noticed, machines tend to make better decisions at a lot of different things, whether it's chess or you know, there's a million different things that um, a, a computer can decide with more accuracy, obviously not perfect, but more accuracy than a human. If there's, if 100 years in the future, what, can there just potentially be an algorithm that all the facts of the case get plugged into and outspits the sentence and whether they're guilty or not guilty or, you know, whatever it is? Oh, I'm, not saying it would work. I'm not saying it would work, but I'm just saying... It, I envision that, you know, 50 or 100 years from now, 
just a, a, a computer generated algorithm that just decides whether it's true or false or yeah um, yeah it's an interesting something question. like that maybe yeah. maybe not guilt or not guilt but maybe because I, I think where I see the court systems get a lot wrong isn't necessarily the guilty or not guilty. I think a lot of the outrage comes from the inconsistency of sentences. Um, and that, that could just be uh, something personal that I've seen. But it, it seems like a lot of the sentencing is very inconsistent, even inside the United States, from state to state, from person to person. So I think an algorithm would be able to take care of that pretty effectively, honestly. Or make it more fine-grained, like they have. Yeah. I think what mi minimum sentencing now, and at least uh, some, yeah, at least something consistent. Um, and if all of that was on the blockchain, because someone's past history, and you know everything would be logged properly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. So that's that's my far off case for that. <laughs> what, what do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I don't like much the sentences <laughs> because, you know, uh, in my understanding, we have only 7 billion people available of uh, human intelligence, okay? And even in the future, if you go ahead 100 or 200 years ahead, I believe we won't have much more than that. So we, we are in the right moment in history where we have the, the most available human intelligence Okay. Right. And and if you get uh, a great portion of that and you put them inside the jails, they want to be able to contribute with their intelligence. So uh, I think we need somehow a way, a dynamics that is going to include those people where they are, they will be able to contribute. Because in my understanding, the brain it is plastic. It, it even uh, changes the shape after heavy training. So I think those people, if they are trained to do good, they will be able to do it. They will contribute a lot. Sometimes we have a lot of geniuses which are using their geniality to do wrong things. And that's not the way it was supposed to be. Maybe they do that because they are rewarded somehow in the dark market. But if the white market is rewarding their more, much more than that, they would be contributing a lot for a greater society in the future. Yeah, you know, you brought you just brought up another interesting point that um, we want as many people as possible to contribute their intelligence. So we want to make the the documentation, the tools of ETC um, accessible, right, to people in Russia, China, the Middle East, Latin America. We want we want the everybody to to be able to join as easy as possible. Uh, that that's what's going to grow ETC the fastest and the best. As an open community, yes. Yep, agreed. Imagine if um, we only had Americans that were doing ETC, right? Vitalik was from Russia. You're from Brazil. That uh, we have so much support from China. We're so much stronger because we, there, the whole world is allowed to to participate in the community. Well, I'm not sure we're getting so much support from Vitalik, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Although well, he started you know, the whole party, so you put it that way. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, so, we are a global community. I guess if we if we were global, the uh, the conference calls would be easier. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. So we come back to the starting of the talk where uh, we were talking about values, because uh, in my understanding, inside each individual there are a set of values. And as people are different, we have different people with different set of values in China, in the United States, in Brazil, and so on, the whole world. What we need to do it is to make sure we give room to people to develop the leaders inside around important values. If there's somebody from uh, Ukraine and they think uh, the community doesn't have an important value for that person, that person should be invited to lead a move inside the community for that important value, in my understanding. So this is going to make the community broader and more valuable in the end. That's where we are right now at the moment. We are trying to make sure we have uh, our values 
and they are going to move forward without being compromised with uh, different interests. Yes. Are, was one of the points you were making was that we need to listen to to diff, to people's opinions because that'll make us stronger and and is that what one of the points you're making? Yes. Okay. To different yeah. voices, people who will be confronting us, they will say, "Oh, come on. We don't have enough inside this path for developing this specific value." Right. Okay. Yeah, because they might, for all we know, they might be a genius, and so we should listen to that person. Right. One one of the values that uh, that motivated iLooks Club was, in my understanding, we should have a balance wherever we go. Because it would yeah. be, it would be better to interact with people. It would it wouldn't be, uh, you know, uneven. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so uh, I, I don't think I have any more questions. Do you, uh, Christian? No. No. Nope, I'm good. Uh, so Daniel, anything else you uh, wanted to cover tonight, or let the people listening out there know, or anything special you want to let the community community know? I want to thank you guys uh, for the work you have been done, and marvelous it is. Oh, thank you. So keep pushing. Keep pushing. That's the the right path to take. I know, uh, and, I know, uh, I know Christian. Christian writes a whole you know a whole ton, and uh, I I'm, I just do this this little this little show, and I do a couple other little things. But I, I always uh, you know big big thanks to the developers. You know you guys you guys are the ones that make this whole thing really possible. I'm just yeah. trying to let everybody know about what you guys. <laughs> yeah, talking is easier than developing. Yeah, I I can do this. I can't I can't write in Rust. <laughs> Or, or code in Rust, sorry. Or Scala, Scala. None of it, none of it. <laughs> uh, so again, uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Daniel. Um, also, special thanks to IOHK uh, for making this broadcast possible. For everyone out there listening, thank you for tuning in, and uh, Happy New Year's, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Good night.